It's always wonderful to assemble together. Exciting this morning to, to get to meet several new people, and that's often the case when we get together. We get to meet new people, and um, we hope that you, as our guests, feel welcome because you are. That's our intention. But it's also good to see all y'all regulars, you know. And so both those things together makes it a good day to be together and a blessing to be together. We hope you feel the same way. There was a, a surgeon and an engineer and a politician who were debating. They were debating which of their professions was the oldest. And the surgeon said, you know, Eve was, was made from Adam's rib, and that, of course, was a surgical procedure. So obviously, surgery is the oldest profession. The engineer shook his head and said, no, before that, you have to remember that order was created out of chaos, and that most certainly was an engineering job. The old politician just leaned back and said triumphantly, aha, just who do you think created the chaos? Well, how would you define chaos? Your child's bedroom? Your husband's work area? Your wife's, well, I better stop. Or I might be creating my own chaos. In the dictionary that I referred to, chaos was defined like this, number one, utter confusion or disorder. Number two, the formless matter supposed to have preceded the existence of the ordered universe. Now let's do a little theology this morning, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Some translations say there that the earth was waste and void. Some translations say formless and empty. And this is the concept of chaos originally. If we go on in... Genesis 1, in the account of creation, it says, And God said, Let there be light. So God begins to take that formlessness, that empty void, that chaos, if you will, and he begins to bring order to it. He creates order. He puts things in order. Our God is a God of order. He fights against chaos all the time. He wants to set things straight. He wants to make things right. That's the nature of the God that we worship. Even in worship, God desires order, does he not? Uh, the Bible expresses God's ideal that in worship, all things should be done decently and in order. That's 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. Now, a lot of the Christian religious world, I think, has ignored that in their practice of worship, or at least forgotten that. Also, some have taken that verse through the years and abused it, and they have equated God's order with their personal preference or the way things have always been done. So we have to be careful with that verse. But the principle remains that God is a God of order. Now, I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to live in certain parts of the world today. To be a family 
living in the Middle East this morning, to be in Israel, to be in Gaza, not as a soldier, not as a politician, not a terrorist, but just mom, dad, and the kids. I can't imagine being in that situation with a family. I can't imagine the chaos and the fear and just the total disruption of life that people are experiencing at this very moment in our world. But then I think about what we wake up to every morning around here. I get up in the morning, and most mornings I turn on the Columbus News. And I can tell you what's going to be on it. There's another shooting. There, there, there's some kind of violence. There's uh, an abducted child. There's a drug bust. I mean, something like that has happened overnight in the city. But. We know that right here in our own town, some people woke up to chaos today. There is a war in their family. There, there's an abusive relative. There's an addiction of some sort that just is making life miserable and nearly unlivable. We know there's people very close to us this morning and that's our reality. I, I see that stuff, I read about it, I hear about it, and, and I think chaos. Sin, abuse, violence, death. You know, none of those things come from God. He is, in fact, the opposite of all of them. The, the picture that I'm trying to paint for us today is that the world we now live in is often chaotic. Bad things happen. And often they happen to good people. Bad things happen to innocent people. And people commit unspeakable atrocities. Mankind's capacity for, for evil is shocking. There is real suffering in this world and there's disaster and there's disorder in short chaos why why has this happened i want us to turn for an answer to one of the great prophets jeremiah jeremiah quotes from the opening verses of the Bible. I think that's interesting. Within the Bible, uh, a prophet quotes from the Scripture. He quotes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, actually. But he does so in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. I want you to listen to what he says there in, in I think, very powerful language. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, beginning. It says there, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a desert. And all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. You know what the prophet is describing there? Chaos. In, in very powerful poetic language, he describes a world reverting back to chaos. It's sort of creation being undone, you see. He, he describes no cities, you know, no good land, no birds, no human beings, no mountains, no heavens, no earth. 
So it's Genesis chapter 1 reversed. Creation undone. The return of chaos. Why has this happened? Well, if you look at the verse right before we read, verse 22, he says this, For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good, they know not. What causes the return of chaos? Sin? Foolishness? Not knowing God? Lack of understanding? The practice of evil? That's what caused it in, in Jeremiah's day, and that has not changed at all in our day. The very same things create chaos today. Now, God is not happy with any of this, of course. This is not his will. He is always fighting against confronting chaos. He battles against it. He works to stamp it out. We could actually read a bunch of verses together from the Old Testament in the Psalms and other places where chaos is pictured as a monster that God is battling against. And this is just a, a theme uh, of Scripture. We can also trace that in the New Testament. Another one of the great prophets, Isaiah, who um, we've been spending some time on as in our assemblies on Sunday, recently, he wrote down one of the most beautiful passages of scripture I think ever recorded. So I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 65. Because in Isaiah 65, God tells us what he intends to do about this, what he intends to do to confront chaos in our world. He, uh, he tells us some plans he has. And I think they're intended to be comforting to us if we're experiencing chaos personally. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the reason this was given originally. They ought to fill us, these plans, with, with hope and with faith and I think with a true zeal to share it with others. We have this promise we have this good news and it's intended to be shared with a world that needs it but I, I read this passage this week in light of the news so if you've been paying attention to what's going on in our world I want that to be in your mind as we read together this text in Isaiah 65 I, I read it with that in mind I, I, I read it in light of the problems I know some people are having. And I read it in, in light of my own life and my own personal struggles. So listen here to what God says through Isaiah, but listen to it as God's word to you in your life, um, in your setting this week, in light of everything that has happened and, and is happening. Isaiah 65, we're going to pick up at verse 17 of that chapter and read down through verse 25. These are the words of God through Isaiah. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days.
or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my children shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for sudden terror. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they're yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now, isn't that a beautiful passage? A beautiful promise from God. I hope that that passage speaks with power to you this week. It sure has to me. Our God is a God of order. He wants to set things straight. And He will. He will. Now, wish, we wish He'd hurry up and do it. I know. But we have to understand He will. And he offers us a time and a place when, when he will again make a perfect place. He gave us one once and we messed it up. But he's bringing another one. He offers a time and a place without chaos. A new heavens and a new earth. You know, Peter says in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, that we as Christians are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's our future. I believe that Scripture clearly teaches that the Lord is coming back and He is bringing heaven with Him. And He's going to make all things new. And folks, we're all invited. We, you know, we get a little taste of that now in Christ's kingdom when we're doing things right. We get a little bit of this in the church of our Lord when we're being who we are called to be. But there's something better coming. Until that happens... We get to be part of confronting chaos. This is one way we can be godly, that is, like God. We get to be part of confronting chaos every time we do good. Every time we practice righteousness, we confront chaos. I suppose you talk to people in the world. I talk to people in the world, and when we have serious conversations, I, uh, I meet people who are concerned about the fact that bad things happen, that bad things happen to good people. I hear that a lot. You know what I'd like us to do as God's people? I'd like us as God's people to be good people that happen to bad things. Let's, let's be good people that happen to bad things. That might help people who are struggling with the fact that bad things happen to good people. Just another way of thinking about confronting chaos. 
Every time we do good things, every time we practice righteousness, we, like our God, confront the chaos of this world. Every time we obey him, every time we obey God, every time we love people, every time we treat each other right, whether we deserve it or not, we chip away at the chaos that's found in this place we live. But there is coming a day when God does away with chaos forever. It's gone, never to return. And we should be waiting for that day with eager anticipation. Let's, let's all be able to pray the prayer of the early Christians. You know what it was? Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's be able to pray. When I was a young man, that was a struggle for me to pray that. I was too attached to this world. But I've seen enough. And now I can pray. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Now it's okay if, if you're too young to be able to pray that fully in your heart, but the day is coming where you will. Folks, that's the Christian prayer. Let's be looking for him because he's bringing something great. Let's pray. God, you're so good. We want to be better. We want to be a better reflection of you and your son. Help us, Lord. We thank you for your patience with us. Help us to be a true light, to be true salt in this world, this world that is hurting and doesn't know why, that is just hungering for you and doesn't know. And if you can give us opportunities to share, we pray that you'll send them. But most of all, we pray that you'll send your son, that he will come quickly. Thank you for your love in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning and thank you for listening. Pray you'll think about these things. And this morning, if you need to respond to heaven's invitation, to the invitation of the Lord Jesus to you personally, we give you this time to come. Let us stand. Let us sing.